I was a military pilot. I flew airplanes and helicopters for the Navy. I'm, I'm gonna retire in about a month and a half in May. So I've done 20 years. I was 15 years of active duty. I started my real estate company while I was flying for the Navy full time. So my story goes like I was in the stock market. I was making, I was a saver. Anybody save a ton of money, just like a big saver, always taught to like save money. Probably raised by like depression era parents, right? And so for me, it was like save, 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 save. I would actually look, I remember I'd look, I would track my net worth every single month. I would look at our credit card, I would print out our credit card statement every month. And when I got married, I'd take it to my wife and say, you gotta stop going to Starbucks. <laughs> it's $5.50 and you go like four times a week. If you just like two times a week, this is how much more money you could have at the end of the month. That was me, I'd save 55% of my salary and I'd, I'd spend 45%. I was so cheap. I would not come to an event like this at that time. I wouldn't even pay 10, 20 bucks. I didn't even buy a book. I had a library card. And you know, if you have a library card, you can get like overdrive, you get the audible on your library card. But sometimes you can't get the book that you want for like three weeks because it's checked out. So I'd have a problem and I'd wait three weeks and spend spending like eight or $10 on Amazon. That's how cheap I was, like truly cheap, right? I thought I could figure it all out myself. I wouldn't even spend to come to an event. I certainly wouldn't take time away from the family and stuff. If it wasn't free, I wasn't interested. And I was trained to not pay money for my education. Although I have a mechanical engineering undergraduate degree, I have a master's in aeronautical engineering, and the US government, you guys and me, all of our tax dollars, paid $1.6 million for me to go to England to go to test school. It's like $2 million in education, formal education, but spent none on my self-education. So for you guys that are here, you're paying money to be here, you're spending time, like applaud yourself and just know that that money is probably better invested in you than it is anywhere else. Like the knowledge and the information that we can attain and what we're capable of is game changing and nobody can ever take that from us. All the stuff that I learned on the street building my businesses, nobody can take it. Take all my money, you get rid of everything. Take all my toys, all my clothes, my watch, my whatever, everything that is somewhat valuable to me and I'll go earn it back again faster. I heard somebody say, you only need to become a millionaire once. Because once you do that, you can do it again and again and again and again and again. It's just easier every time. And I totally believe that. If you take everything that I have, drop me on any street corner of anywhere in the USA, and I can figure out how to make money now. Build a business, build systems, build process, and be able to scale because of what I know. And I want, in the short period of time I have, transfer as much of that knowledge that I have to you guys as possible. Flying helicopters and airplanes for the Navy, I got married, and then we had a child, we got pregnant pretty quick. So now I went from feeding one person to feeding three. Started freaking out, like I gotta find a side hustle. I was investing all my money in the stock market, it was growing slow, I was gonna be a millionaire one day. When I was 65, I mapped it all at 8% return, 65, I've had a million bucks. You guys know what I'm talking about? My IRA, I started pulling from my IRA, my 401k, all the crap that they taught me. The stock market is like brainwashing us. Any stock brokers in here? Or you? <laughs> <laughs> I am a financial planner and this is what I sell. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm un unapologetically honest now. That is not the way that I would, that I, I, at the time I thought I was gonna go there, that's, I was gonna be a millionaire one day. What I realized is there's a better way to do that. And you guys are in the place, like I don't have to, I don't have to, I'm in church and I don't preach real estate. You guys all believe, you're believers in real estate from what I can tell you're here, right? So that's what I did. I found real estate and started buying some rental houses. Any landlords in here buying rental houses? That's what you're trying to do? Start buying rental houses. I was like, I'm gonna get to 10 rental houses. I'll make $100,000 a year. I'll retire from the Navy. Do my $120,000 a year, whatever it is. I'll be set. 200 grand a year. And then I flipped my first house. I was in Patuxent River, Maryland. I was a test pilot after New England. And I was buying a rental, but my real estate agent, any real estate agents in here? She said, you know, if you sold this house, you could make some serious money. What does she want? Second commission, baby, right? She wanted a second commission. So I fixed it up, I sold it, I made $45,000, it took me six months. Anybody want $45,000 in here? Yeah. Six months, 45 grand, that was half my salary. Half my government salary, I was like, I got it made. It took me six months to find my next deal. I had moved to Pensacola since then, so I went from Maryland to Florida, bought another house there, made $43,000 on that one. So not only did I do it once, but now I repeated it. I said, there's, there's a system here, there's a process. I know I can make this happen. I um, reluctantly invested $25,000 in my education in a mastermind called Seven Figure Flipping. Um, you see me wearing the shirt right now, they talk about it a lot here in the group. Um, I was a member of that community. I had my mentor, Andy, and Justin, Justin Williams, Andy McFarland. They showed me how to build a team, how to scale, how to, 
out of good systems and processes. I went from doing one deal that year to doing 67 houses. I flipped 12, I wholesaled 55. And I did almost $700,000 in revenue with a team of two and me. And then after that, we did $1.3 million the next year. We did 135 houses. Then we did 187 the year after that. And then we consistently did about 200 houses a year, every single year, mostly wholesale. 80% wholesale, 20% flip. That's kind of my story. I built and scaled a team, put a COO in place. I, had, I was working about two hours every week or so, every two weeks, just on a meeting with him. He ran the entire company. And I was able to become a coach for Justin in Seven Figure Flipping. About a year later, I bought the company from him. I've owned it for about three and a half years. But I systemized and built a business. By the way, I was flying airplanes for the Navy full time while I built my company. We're doing one and a half million, 1.3 million, and I was still flying 10, 12 hours a day, every single day, and one weekend a month. So when people come up to me and say they don't have time to build a business or to scale or to grow or to do anything, I don't have time for that. Like, I don't listen to it, it's garbage. It's all trash that's inside of our head that somebody's saying you don't have time for something. I woke up at 5.30 in the morning, sometimes 5 a.m. I was in my office until seven, got my son up, we played, ate breakfast, and then I went to fly all day. I came home, had spent time with the family, had dinner. My wife watched TV, put her son to bed. I went to the office till about 10 or 11 o'clock and I did that every single day for me. So my wife was probably not gonna see me for a year, but I built this business, I'm dedicated to it. That's what I did. I did what I said I was gonna do. I needed help, I had a mentor, I had some people in my life that had already done it, that were willing to show me how to do it, granted I had to pay for it. Best investment I ever made in my entire life. But it was investment, it was action, and it was belief that allowed for all that stuff to happen. All of those were on me, nobody else. So I see a lot of people point the finger at blame. It's a challenge. So grew that business, took over seven figure flipping, took that company from doing maybe a million and a half or so a year to we did about seven and a half million last year, top line. And a company we have about 22 people that work for me right now. Built that business. Also got a hard money lending company now that I, I invest money in. I invest, I do like loans, short-term transactional funding. I have an owner finance company where we buy houses in Kentucky and we owner finance them to people. I'm the money partner in there. I'm the money partner in apartment investing business where we buy and sell apartments. We do it in six to eight apartments a year. We have an apartment mastermind too that we spun up. And uh, I also run a farm in my backyard, about 13 acres. I've scaled that up. We did about $250,000 of revenue last year. We fed 60 families in a box CSA, a subscription box. And uh, let's see, I raised 42 chickens for slaughter, for, or 41 for me, for my family. We have beef that we sell. We have all kinds of stuff. I buy wholesale, sell retail, I flip cows. I do all kinds of stuff. So I tell you all that to say, people look at me and are like, this guy's really busy, he does a lot of stuff. But the way I do a lot of stuff is with systems and processes. I have people that help me. I can't do any of this stuff by myself. It's impossible. But I don't know if you believe this, but I was deathly afraid to hire my first person. I was like, I remember the first call with my mentor, Andy. I said, I'll do anything but that. I just want to do it by myself. Anybody feel like that? You don't want to hire anybody? You just do everything yourself? It's okay. We're in a friendly room here. Raise your hand if you feel that way. Hire. Hire. Come on, we're all recovering people here. Yep, there we go. So I was so scared. I, I was in the military. I was an officer in the Navy. I had been leading people my entire life, my entire career, but I didn't have to write the check. My biggest fear was around the fact that I would commit to them and we wouldn't be successful and I wouldn't be able to pay their salary and put food on the table for their family and their kids. It was a big responsibility, I thought. Anybody feel like that? Let's just raise our hand. That's what's holding you back. I'm telling you right now, it's holding you back from growth. And honestly, from my favorite thing in the entire world right now. My favorite thing right now is putting food on other people's table and being able to support them in their family. And know that they have an amazing community, an amazing place to be, and a place to work. And I can use that leadership. I was just afraid, I was scared. It was all in here, and in here. It was all fear. Pretty much everything, anybody Tony Robbins fan? Tony Robbins fans in here? Cool. All right, we're about to start jumping and dancing and singing. You guys ready? We're gonna turn up the AC? No. Um, if you don't know who Tony Robbins is, you do not get that joke. Um, Tony says there's only two real fears in, in the world. That's it. I won't be loved, and I'm not good enough. That's it. Everything that you're possibly scared of boils down to those two things. And for me, that was my fear. I wouldn't be good enough. I wouldn't be able to build this business. I wouldn't be able to support these people. Best thing I ever did was listen to my mentor and hire that first person. I hired my first person, guess what? 
What happened do you think? What? Hired another one? You think it went great? It went perfect? I wish I said that it did. My second hire went perfect. But my first hire, her name was Jamie. Nobody knows Jamie in the story. Everybody knows a woman named Dee Dee. Dee Dee on the surface was my first hire, but really she was my second. I hired this woman named Jamie. I was freaked out. I found her on Craigslist. So this is a time when I could hire on Craigslist. Very nice. It's like 2014, 2015. I hire her on Craigslist, and she comes into the company. I get her all trained up, ready to go. She starts answering the phones. Two weeks to get She calls me and says, hey, thank you for your My husband got a job in Alabama, or in, in Virginia, and we got a move. So I'm sorry. I was devastated. Two options at that point. What could I have done? What? We have to fold or keep going. Cry in a closet. I've done that before, by the way. Literally cried in a closet. And I'll maybe I'll tell you the story. Um, so I could have walked away. I could have said, this doesn't work. I was right. Andy was wrong. I was right. I'm out. That's what so many people do. They quit before they get started, right? They, one, one mistake, one mistake, one mistake, and you're out. But you're like, you're right there. And so I hired, I just randomly, I had my eyes open, I knew what I wanted, reticular activated assistant kicked off, and I was at a flip where this woman was helping me, she met a wholesaler, I said, do you want to come work with me instead of doing it on your own? And then DD came into my life. Best thing that ever happened. It worked for me for like five years, four or five years. She is the reason why my business was growing while I was flying, she was working, worked out great. I mean, the story's not perfect. Lots of things happened with me and Dee Dee. She, she left, Dee Dee left my company to go start a bookkeeping business with her best friend. Amazing. Like, I'm building leaders and entrepreneurs. I've had like four or five people that work for me that I don't run big companies. Some run multi-million dollar companies that used to work with me. And that's the biggest blessing and gift that like, I can get from somebody is I'm building leaders that decide to go do something else. Their life change and shifts. I'm not scared of that. I know that's going to happen. So, you guys came here, that's my story. So I've done a lot. I've done probably, I don't know, eight or 900 deals inside the company. I don't I don't run my blackjack real estate business full time now. I brought a partner in about a year, year and a half ago, and he runs the business full time. I'm a minority partner in there. I'm a consultant, I work with him, he's got questions, I fund deals for us sometimes, things like that. I help him grow and scale the business. He also helps me inside seven figure flipping. Um, I spend the majority of my time in seven figure flipping and at my home. Now, and then all the other all the other businesses are money-based businesses. I raise money or I put my own money in, and I've been able to find money, raise money, build capital that gets me into deals. I'll tell you right now, if you want to develop a skill set, like leadership and money, these are the two biggest skill sets you can grow. Because every like seriously, who need, who in here needs more money? Raise your hand if you need more money. Yeah. So if I have more money, you guys all want to talk to me, right? Yeah. I mean that and maybe acquisitions and deal flow. If you can control the deal and control the money, these are the two biggest things in real estate. This is where this is where you make the big bucks, right? Man, I have not used a handheld mic in like three years. This is really challenging. Usually have one of these and use both my hands and go crazy. Um, this is gonna be a challenge. <coughs> so you guys want scale? You gotta do it. Um, you guys, and some of you want to get started. So we have a, a, an imbalanced room right here. I'll tell you right now, everything that you're going through stems from belief. Your belief system and the thoughts that you think in your head control everything. Who here has heard mindset like five million times? Okay. Are you sick of it or do you love it? You, okay, you love it. I know you love it because you keep paying me. Like seriously, are you sick of it? Or do you, are you, some of you like, I'm tired of hearing this term. Like it's getting annoying. I really want you to lean into this. Like I, I know this, there's could be some like foo-foo stuff around mindset. But I'm telling you guys right now, that is the game. The game is won in the space and distance that you have between your two years. That thing will totally sabotage you and it. Your brain will stop you from doing very big things. I truly believe that like the best thing about real estate is it does not discriminate. Real estate and even business does not discriminate. Have you seen business owners that you're like, I have no idea how that person is? Right? Have you seen this? Like they're in the United States running a huge business and they only speak English? There's a donut shop right down the street from me. She is amazing. Absolutely amazing. Barely speaks English. Has an amazing product. Her marketing kind of sucks. We have to help that. But it's incredible. And then you see people who you're like, wait a second, like I knew that person in high school. How are they successful? 
Like they were stupid. They, 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 they couldn't get through school. But they're running a huge business right now. They're hugely successful. What's going on? Right? I don't know if you're any of those people I just mentioned, but I'm telling you, you can do this for sure. Like you just have to figure out your way of doing things. And a lot of times you think it's like, there's like a recipe. You know when you're like, you're baking a cake. There's a recipe, right? So you've got cakes and then you got like five star dishes in a restaurant, right? And that chef is just like sprinkling stuff on and just like throwing things in and flipping the pan. But the baker is making very specific recipes, right? You gotta follow the recipe. You can't put too much baking powder in. You can't put too much flour. You can't put too much sugar in there. You can't put salt instead of sugar. It's not gonna taste good. Like all this stuff, right? There's no real recipe to this. Like it's your own flavor that you put into your business. Every single one of these, who's got a successful business? Who's doing seven figures or more a year in business? Hi. Okay, these people are doing seven figures a year in business. I bet every single one of them run it a little bit different. They run their business with their values, with their character, and we have a different community. Like if you come into my community, it's gonna look a little bit different than somebody else's real estate investing coaching community. It's gonna look different. You're gonna see people wearing like jeans and a t-shirt, and I don't know, they're, they got kids, a lot of kids, we got tons of kids, we got values, you're not gonna see a lot of cursing, you're not gonna have a lot of Alcohol being thrown around like crazy. It's just not what our community is. I go to some of these other masterminds. It's like a bunch of booze. It's just like run around. Like it's just not my thing. It's not my style. And I bring my character in. You bring your character in. So what I'm trying to get at is each one of you have the ability to do really big things your way. Okay? What you need to do is you need to start watching other people and see what they're doing. I take a little bit of something here. I'm going to take a little bit from you. I'm gonna take a little bit of your, your special stuff and take a little bit from you, like learn what you're doing. And that's why these rooms are so powerful. That's why these groups are so powerful. The more time you spend with these folks, the folks that raise their hand, they're doing seven figures or more a year, you just get to learn a little bit from them. They're, he, they're here with you, never have done a deal. And what I don't want you to do is I don't want you to be the person who shows up every single month and says, I've never done a deal. I've never done a deal. And you just wanna keep showing up. I remember when I used to go to local real meetings and meetups, there are people that just like want to stand in the corner and social And then there's the real movers and shakers. And I was trying to figure out like who is who. You know what I'm talking about? You guys are probably doing it right now. Right, you're doing it right now? I hope so. I just asked like people to raise their hand five different times. I hope you've noticed the people that have money. I hope you notice the people that have deals. I hope you notice the people that are making seven figures. And you're intentionally in your head saying, I'm gonna go talk to that person. Even if you're as awkward and as com uncomfortable as me, I would ask that this. Who here is an introvert? Hi, raise your hand high. Okay, you've already like defined yourself as some identity, which is probably a mistake. But I feel like I'm an introvert too. I'm very uncomfortable being in large set. I can speak to thousands of people. I did a talk for 5,000 people this year, and I nailed it, I had no problem. But walking around the hallway, a little bit awkward, and I'd just rather just kind of like blend in, even though I know I can't do that for my business. Could you imagine if you were an investor in my company and I was walking around, not talking to people about what I do, making sales, marketing myself? Would you appreciate that as an investor in my business? No. Mike, would you appreciate that as an investor in my business? No. You want me at that event of 5,000 people going up and talking to every single person about how we're awesome, what we do at Seven Figure Flipping, and why they should join our community, right? Same thing in you and your business. If you are an introvert right now, and you say I'm an introvert, when I come to these things, I'm not gonna to talk to anybody, you're making a huge mistake. <coughs> Who's the extrovert in the room? Raise your hand higher. I usually they go, woo! You guys are not real extroverts. Let's do it again. Extroverts in the room, raise your hand. Yeah! Are you Marie? Marie? We've got a Marie in the house. You should have Marie. So I did that at the event of 5,000. I said, uh, I said, hey, uh, Marines. And I was like, I'm in the Navy. Marines, shout out. They were like, oh. And then it's like, Army. They're like, ooh. And then I was like, Coast Guard. I was like, no. <laughs> it's kind of fun to make that joke. So. Um, extroverts, I encourage you to grab one of the introverts and pull them around and talk to them at an event like this, okay? Because I guarantee they have something that you need. And somebody else has something that, that, that you need. So talk to these people, network. That's something that I've had to train and learn into myself to be able to get to the next level. So you guys want to learn like very specific was when I joined the mastermind group and this guy was talking on the podcast that I was listening to, his name's Justin, the guy who sold me this 25K program. Um, 
he was talking about systems all the time. I remember hearing his <clears throat> assistant, uh, Vanessa, who was on a podcast. He did a two, two part series with her. And she was doing everything. This guy was doing like 150 houses a year and fitting through a light bulb. Like literally. He, I know him very well. I bought the company from the for a long time. He literally cannot screw up. Like, dude, brings everything that he touches. Looking at 150 houses all across the country at scale. And so he kept talking about systems. And so I remember getting on the first call with my mentor, Andy, and he said, I said, hey, just give me the systems, man. I paid 25 grand, I want the systems. And much like you guys, you're here waiting for me to give you this like silver bullet. And I'll be real with everyone that I ever talk to. And it's not always flashy and exciting and, and, and in your face, but I'm like, give me the book that shows me exactly how to do this. And what he said was, what do you want to do? I said, I want to flip 12 houses in the next year. I'll make $30,000 per flip, $360,000. And he said, okay, what are you doing now? I said, I'm doing one house a year. I'm making $45,000 on it. I'm willing to make less and do more. And he said, okay, why did you join this group? I said, well, I'm running to and from the houses all the time. I'm stopping on my way to work, on my way home from work. I'm doing tile in my flight suit because my contractors didn't show up. And I'm saving money by being the general contractor on the deal and getting a, I own the house like permit, like, you know, owner drawn permits and all this stuff I'm doing all myself to save money. And he's like, all right, well, why aren't you doing more? I was like, I don't have time to do more. He said, okay, well, you should hire somebody. I said, I'm not gonna hire anybody. Okay, well, right now you take six months to do a project, takes you six months to find the next one, you're stopping on your way to and from work, and you can't get it all done, so what are you gonna do? I said, that's why I hired you. You tell me what to do, right? And he said, hire somebody. And I said, no. And he said, okay, well, this call is over, and call me back when you're ready to listen to me. Or go think about it and see what you're gonna do. So for about a week, I hung up the phone, or I got a Zoom call, it's like, this was Zoom 2015. Okay, you guys on Zoom in 2015? Yeah. It was pretty new. Not a lot of people knew about it. Yeah. Flipping Houses Exposed by Danny Johnson. Reading this book about all of his leads and all these things. And I'm like, man, I gotta do this. I stayed up all night reading this ebook. And the next day I reach out to him and we get on another call. I'm like, all right, I'm ready. I'm ready to listen. And I just take down everything that he says. This is how you hire somebody, this is who you should hire, this is how you do it. I was like, all right, I'm doing it. So there was no book systems. I'm here to tell you that your systems are your people. They're the people that you surround yourself with, that you bring into your world. And how you pour into those people, and how you develop those people, how you lead, manage, and hold those people accountable, L and A, lead, manage, and hold them accountable, is going to be the way that you want to You have to be able to let go of the things that you think that you're great at. Because there's somebody out there that's really good. At that thing here. What's that? This thing here, yeah. Yes, sir. They are way better than you. And listen to this. What if you hired somebody that's not as good as you? Do you guys think that you're the best? You think you're you guys think you're pretty awesome, right? You think you're pretty awesome, right? Raise your hand if you think you're awesome. Raise your hand. Yeah, come on. Okay, if you're not raising your hand, you, you don't think you're awesome? You're never gonna be awesome if you don't think you're awesome. So your guys are probably awesome at a lot of stuff. You're probably some of the best in the world at some stuff, right? But let's say there's somebody out there that is 70% as good as you at that stuff, or that thing. 70% as good as you. And can we agree that there's somebody, all the people that said you're awesome? Think about the thing that you're most awesome at, whatever it is. Let's just say that there's somebody out there that's 70% as awesome as you at that point, okay? Can we agree that there is that person out there, brother? Okay, cool. I'm not even saying that there's something better than you. We'll get there. 70% as good as you, right? And let's say there's two things that you're awesome at. And you hire two people that are 70% as good as you. What do we get? 140% of you, right? And you in the company. Isn't that how we scale? Isn't that how we grow? Isn't that how we build and develop ourselves and our company? And then what happens is they get trained by you. And they only have to do that one thing. You know how awesome you are at all that stuff? But when you're doing all the things, you're not really awesome at anything. 
And so now that's all they do. And they, even if they're not as good as you when they start, they're better than you at just doing that. And then if they do more of that, they will eventually become better than you if you let them. And you don't sabotage them like most of them. Me included sometimes. So you start developing and building these people up. You get them trained. And then you move on to the next thing. So here is exactly how I scaled my business. Ready? Exactly. It was just me for like a year. And I was marketing and I was trying to do deals and I was going on appointments and making offers and I was trying to close stuff. And then I hired, I, I got nothing. I got nothing about it. Like nothing. I started buying houses at auction. I brought in a 50 50 partner. We did pretty well with that. Like he brought all the money and I found houses at auction. You know, you know, market for deals. When I started actually marketing for my own deals, I brought in Dee Dee and she started getting on the phone because I hate talking on the phone. I hate it. In fact, Jennifer, in the back, who brought me this water, she has my phone all the time. And she answers my phone. And the stuff that says spam risk, I don't know if she answers it or not, but I don't have to answer it. Do you guys answer your phones? Do you guys like talking on your phone? I do. Not very much. You like talking on your phone? Yeah. You don't like it? Nice. Depends on who's calling and what they want and what's in it for you. Absolutely, he says. Of course. So, what happened was, okay, hear me out. Who here doesn't like talking? About it? Doesn't, does not like, it. don't like talking. About it. Do you guys send marketing out? You guys send marketing out for your businesses and your companies, but you don't like talking on your phone? Do you think that if you had someone who loves talking on the phone, and loves answering the phone, and like lives to answer the phone, that you would send out more marketing? Okay, here's what I found. I was going to master my meetings and I was turning off my marketing or I was going on vacation or I had a flight, I had a very busy week for flying. And I was like, I'm not gonna market this week because I can't answer the phone, I can't call anybody. You guys know what I'm talking about? I've done that before? And so I stopped, I stopped my marketing for the week. That affects my business a month or two months down the road. Not right then. Because I'm just, it makes sense. Like, why would I spend the money, spend $1,000 to send out marketing when I'm not gonna be able to answer the phone? So then I hired Dee Dee and she answers the phone and she, I had to tell her to stop talking on the phone so much. She's talking about church and cats to somebody who's not going to have a house. And for an hour, I'm listening to her calls and I'm like, Dee Dee, do you know that we get charged by the minute? She's like, no, I didn't know. I said, stop talking about church and cats unless they have a house in your building report, right? She loved talking on the phone. So what did I do? What did I do when she started to answer the phone? Send out a more marketing, right? More marketing, I was like, oh, I don't have to answer it. I don't care how much the phone rings. Make it ring more, because that's the money phone. We call it the money phone. So I'd recommend you start naming these things, like, because then she'd be at dinner, and she'd turn to her husband and start ringing. She's like, I gotta go, the money phone's ring. Bill tells me I gotta answer the money phone. And she'd be answered at like six o'clock, seven o'clock, nine o'clock at night. I wouldn't tell her to do that, but I didn't tell her not to. Either, okay? She got paid by the week, all right? And she also got a bonus. So here's another little tip. I paid a bonus for anything I want people to do more of. If I want somebody to focus on something, I'll pay them a bonus. I had a transaction coordinator, somebody who like worked with title companies, worked with sellers that I hired, and she for, for like six months, she's like, I can't get anybody to do testimonials for us. They just won't do them. They don't want to talk on camera, they're shy. And the second I said, I'll give you $150 for every testimonial you get. Immediately, every single person is like, I don't know what happened, but these people love talking on cameras. I don't know if we send marketing to new people, but they all want to give testimonials. She's like, boom, boom, like five a month. Testimonials. That's how it works. Give some incentive, get some reason. So, okay, here's how to hire. Here's who to hire. Self-assessment. What are you good at? What are you not good at? What do you love to do? What do you do? I hate to answer that. I love to do business to business sales. I would love to sell you something. Like I would love to sell you some business products, something that'll help you because I know your pain, I know your struggle, I know your issues, I know the things that are holding you back that are stopping you, and I know that I have something that can help you. So I have no problem selling you. Same with the house. I know how an investor thinks, I'm an investor. I know how they think, I know what they need, they need more houses. They need more houses, they need to make more money, they need a cruise running. As a wholesaler, I can sell you a house for my price, 
and where we both feel like we kind of got a bad one, right? We both feel like, ah, oh, man, he, he, I, I didn't pay as much as I wanted to pay, and I, I got a little bit lesser. I, I love to have a negotiation with a, with a buyer, right? So I know what I love to do, business to business sales. I don't really love business to customer sales, but I'm okay with it, like I'll, I'll do it. Like in-home sales, I just don't like sitting there for three hours on a Saturday when I could be playing with my son at the time, you know? You know when the seller's like, I don't know how much my house is worth. You spend three hours with them and at the end you give your offer and they're like, they point at every single house in the neighborhood. It's like, well, that house sold for this and this is like three hours and you told me you had no idea. I hated that. So what are you good at? What do you love to do? What do you hate to do? Start making that out. And then say, what would I love to offload to somebody right now? So for me, I want to offload the phone and I needed admin tasks. I was flying 10, 12 hours a day, every day. I can't answer the phone when I'm in an airplane at 13,000, 14,000 feet doing loops, nailing around rolls and teaching students how to fly and, and killing me in the land pattern. I'm trying to kill you, I'm trying to kill you. So what do you get at, what do you love to do, what do you hate to do? So your first hire is different for each and every moment. So anybody that tells you this is the first person they should hire in real estate business, run away from that method. It's different for all of you. It might be a bookkeeper, it might be a a uh, lead intake person, it might be an acquisition salesperson, it might be a disposition person, it might be a transaction person, it might be a title company, it might be a realtor, it might be lots of different, it might be a project manager, it might be somebody to help you raise money. All kinds of different things, right? So what are you good at? And then hire that first person. Here's what you do. You don't go hire three or four people at the same time. I see businesses all the time. They hire five people, three people, two people, and they're trying to scale, because they're trying to scale. They hear scale, and they say, I gotta do lots. You have to pour into that person for an extended period of time before they can even be left on their own to do much of it, okay? So go hire that person, and then you wear all the rest of the hats, but you gave up one hat. My mentor Andy used to uh, talk about these cups. What he, say, what he said is, when your cup fills up, get another cup and empty your cup a little bit into that cup. And then, now you have two cups. And then, their cup's gonna fill up, and your cup's gonna fill up faster, particularly. Then you grab another cup, and empty some of your cup. These are the people that I hired. So I hired a lead intake person. And then I still didn't get a deal. For four and a half months, I was spending $5,000 a month, and I still didn't get a deal. But I set six months budget, $30,000, and four and a half months in, we got that first deal. $9,900, I still remember that wholesale fee. So it was $10,000 minus 100, because my attorney took 100 to get all the money off the HUD at the time. I did this like per personal property closing, this weird thing, she took 100 bucks and it worked great for me. $9,900, and that was my belief shift and change, but it took me hiring a salesperson on 100% commission to go in and close that deal, because I wasn't, here's why. Remember, it was flying 10 or 12 hours a day, and one week in a month I was gone, so I was only going to really hot leads which sounded hot on the phone. You guys know what I'm talking about? When they're like, oh yeah. Like, and so I was going to these leads that sounded good on the phone, but they were really kind of crap. And all, you know all the tough guys and gals on the phone? Like they want retail, but then you go out to the house and it's like termites holding hands and it's a shack and they said it needs no work. You know what I'm talking about? And you go out to the house and you start pointing things out and next thing you know, they like, their price comes down in half. So she started going on every appointment, every lead. It didn't matter, retail lead, anybody that called us, anybody that came to the system. She went out and made offers on, and we started doing deals. We did that deal, then we did two, then we did three, then we did five, and it was just, when she was hungry, like really hungry, everybody in the last round, hungry. Right, you know what I'm talking about? She was that. She had a vendetta, she was gonna go make money. And the reason why these people came in and worked with me is because I had passion, I was excited. I told, like, she left a full-time job with a brand newborn baby and her husband, who made like $30,000 a year working as a mechanic. She was the breadwinner of the family, we met at Denny's. I found her on Craigslist, her name was Eunice. And I was like, I have no idea why you're leaving your full-time job to come in and work with me, but let's go. I had no experience, I had, I had flipped a couple houses, but they got to see your vision as the owner. The way that you scale is you bring people in, you cast your vision, you get them excited to follow you, to go where you want to go. People don't want to work with yours. Then, oh, everything's just not gonna work. Everything's bad, it's dark outside, it sucks. They want to work with people who are exciting, who are like passionate, 
who they can see, like, you're going. I'm going with or without you. Get on the train. Let's go. This train is going 100 miles an hour down the highway. Let's go. Get on. Right? They don't want to work with somebody who shows up like, I'm not sure if this is going to work. Your team should never see you sweat. Never see you sweat. They should always see where you're going, what you're doing, and you freak out in the closet by yourself crying. Or with the rest of your tribe, the rest of your people who are also in the closet crying because things aren't working out. And we figure out how to fix it. I probably will tell that story at some point. I'm trying to get there, I don't know how. So, I'm telling you guys, that is how you scale. You scale responsibly. You scale one employee, team member at a time. You scale a few more deals at a time and you start growing. And I did this for a year and a half. I grew and then I plateaued. You know why? Why did I plateau? Anybody know? Why did I, why did I plateau and just like level out for a little bit? Complacency. What? Complacency. Complacency, that's an interesting answer. Incorrect, sir. I'll tell you why. I don't get complacent. Why would I get complacent? Come on, I'm laser focused. Sometimes we do get complacent. We get a little bit too big for our britches, we get complacent, and that's where we start losing money. But no, I didn't I didn't go down. I was growing and I plateaued. Why? Come comfort. on. Huh? Comfort. Comfort, okay. Also wrong. What? Didn't make your next hire. What? Didn't make your next hire. Didn't make my next hire, okay. Money. Money, this is interesting. What? You hit a mental ceiling? This is interesting. So, okay. Maybe I need it. What? No, let me, maybe, maybe. Okay, so let me change it. I did this on purpose. Systems. Systems, okay. I did this on purpose. What, what are you doing when you're growing? What, what does it take to grow? What does it take to grow? Time. Time. What is it? Effort. Time, effort, energy. Okay, here's what it takes. It takes an investment. It takes an investment. Somebody just said money. Who said money? You said money. Oh, you, the cameraman, yeah, all right. Hey, by the way, if you do this on a regular basis and you do video for events and things like that, speakers, you have the best job in the world. There's a cameraman at my last event, Footpacking Live. He, he like quit his job to go to do real estate and he's like messaging me on a regular basis. He's like, dude, you inspired me. I'm like, oh crap, like, I don't know why I did that. Like, the guy who I hired that does all of our events can be so pissed at me and all these cameramen keep quitting and doing real estate. <laughs> it's a real, you got, you get, they get the best content, they get the best information, they can go to the best event, you're the best speakers, get motivated, get inspired, and they're like, quit. So, it, I did it on purpose, okay? What'd you say? They have it on video too. That's it, yeah. <laughs> are, you a vi- are you a video guy? No. Are you a video? Because you want to quit your job. That's okay. It's just inspire you to quit your job. So, so I did it on purpose, okay? I, I didn't I didn't plateau, I didn't hit ceiling, I didn't have mindset, none of this stuff. Like I was investing back into the business time and money, right? And I was pumping money back into the business. What did I have to do? What did I want to do? Take money out? I wanted to get paid. <laughs> like I want to put some money in my pocket. So many times the big downfall that you see with so many, especially in real estate companies, like scale, 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 scale. Like if you really study business, I, I want you guys to be business owners. I don't want you to be like side hustlers. You want to do some side hustle, that's fine. You can do that, no problem. Be a side hustler. It's okay, that's fine. But I teach people how to build a business, like a real business. In, in real estate investing, in multi, whatever they want to do, build a real business. Like people come to us, they have other businesses, they want to do real estate, they're like, holy crap, like we've been able to systemize, automate, use a lot of these tools and strategies in our other business to make a ton more money. It's transferable to anything. The knowledge you can learn in the real estate business or any business, can, can, go, can transcend anything, any, it's just a widget. Real estate's the widget that you make money. It's the best widget, but it's a widget. So I need to put money back in my pocket and take it off the table. I needed to get paid. I dumped all of my money. I had W-2, remember I was in the military, right? So I could beat the other people that didn't have full-time jobs because they had to get paid. So I could dump my money intentionally back into my business, not pay myself a W-2 income because I was making like 120 grand from the military full-time. So I said, I'm gonna reinvest, reinvest, reinvest and grow. And then I put it, but I, I put myself, this is more like technique. I put a W-2 income on the books that I paid myself. So the business owed me about $250,000. And then when I was plateauing, I wrote myself a check for $250,000 from the business. Put my money back in my pocket, right? 
Five tickets. So this is what businesses do. They scale, they retool, they scale, they retool. Here's what happens to the businesses that have struggled. They're constantly growing and scaling and dumping money back in the business. The business owner never really gets paid. They wonder why they still do this after three or four years of not making enough money. 98% of small to mid-sized businesses, less than $150 million a year. The owner makes less than $76,000 a year. Isn't that it? 98% of small and mid-sized businesses. Businesses making less than $150 million a year, the owner makes less than $76,000. That's because they're just doing this, and then something happens, market correction, a, sh a, a shift, a twist, a change. The, the, not just the real estate market, the actual like need and demand of the customer changes and all the business equity that's being built goes like this. And who's that hit? Business owners. Flippers, they go from flipping one house to flipping two houses at a time to four houses at a time to six to eight to 12 to 20. And they say they're flipping 500 houses at a time, but the business owner is not putting any money in their pocket and cash flow is a big struggle. Any house flippers in the room feel that? It's true, it happens, yeah. I know you raise your hand. It's not scale, scale, scale. It's scale, automate, scale, automate. Pay yourself. And then when your money's in your pocket, hey, let me ask you this. Who's got a business credit card and a personal credit card? Who, for you guys, and a business person, credit cards and personal credit cards, when there's an expense, and if you had those two credit cards to choose, and you're gonna buy something, and you look at your personal credit card, and it's gonna have to go on that, and you go, I don't know if I'm gonna buy that. But you go, oh, it's on the business, it's a business expense. Yeah, we should buy another iPad, we should buy another Mac, we should buy another phone, we should buy another meal at the restaurant, we should go out, go to Vegas, whatever, right? It's easier to spend the company money, isn't it? It's easier to justify and do it. The same thing happens with the money in your business bank account. You don't make good decisions. When you put it in your bank account, you make great decisions. And this is some te like, techniques and tactics to scale. Hiring and decision-making and money trying. And these are the things that allow me to do what I did as fast as I did. I mean, you usually hit your center going, you went from one house to 67 to 135 to 187. He must be smarter or know something that I don't know or whatever. No, not really. I just saw other people doing it and I knew it was possible. And I said, if they could do it, I can do it. And then I just figured it out. It wasn't easy. None of that was easy. But I told you, I was working pretty much nonstop for an entire year. Trying to figure it out. Hiring, firing, problems, issues, getting sued, like all kinds of stuff. You know, it's just, it was all the work in the dark that then when you stand in the light, you shine really bright, right? And so you gotta put in the work in the dark. But I'm not also not like a hustle factory guy. You don't need to go out and just hustle, hustle, hustle.